Welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Lieutenant General Prakash Katoch, who retired as commander of uh, the Special Forces of the Indian Army. He is also a prolific writer, and he has been writing uh, not just on military affairs, but also other issues that concern the country. Uh, welcome to News Click, sir. Thank you. I'd like to begin by asking you something that. Uh, Chief of uh, the Army Staff, General Bipin Rawat said recently at uh, one of the meetings where he talked about and introduced the subject matter of hybrid warfare. And I quote, hybrid warfare, he said, is a form of war fighting which is all encompassing. Rather than focusing on destroying an enemy's military capability, it focuses on population and infra as the center of gravity. It covers the full spectrum of warfare by combining the vigor, lethality of conventional warfare with fanatical fervor of irregular warfare and untapped spectrum of technology for cyber and info warfare. It also entails creating acts of criminal disorder, law and order issues, and public disorder in the target country during peace. It embodies the age-old saying, all is fair in war, unquote. So, would you, uh, can you explain to a normal person what this means? Uh, when he says that the focus, uh, the center of gravity is not just military capability of the enemy, but it focuses on population and infra. I agree 100% with what General Rawat has said. In fact, we have been fighting hybrid war for the past 20 years, mm. even in the case of Pakistan or with China. Conventional war is only one part of hybrid warfare, whereas the understanding generally in India is that war means conventional war. So any problems, whether we have So is a hybrid warfare what is also called counterinsurgency uh, 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 counter uh, operations? Not exactly. You see, hybrid warfare... So what different, uh, what distinguishes hybrid warfare from counterinsurgency? See, we have uh, conventional warfare, we have subconventional warfare, which is below the level of the conventional warfare. Counterinsurgency and counterterrorism will be part of the subconventional warfare in which you have also the employment of irregular forces, which Pakistan has been doing against us. Now, <clears throat> in order to fight that, it can't be f if it is against the nation, the hybrid warfare is against the nation, not against the military. So it is not the military alone that can fight hybrid warfare. It has to be at the national level. But say, if there is a hybrid war in, say, domains of cyber warfare, electromagnetic and uh, space, the military doesn't have any say here. It has to be done at the So when you level. say that the sh focus shifts to the center of gravity, shifts to population and it infra, does. It does. Uh, and not the military capabilities, no. so it's... No, it includes both. The center of gravity will remain uh, the population, but the application of military power also is as important. Mm -hmm. Because in present day warfare, what is happening is that conventional wars are receding. They are not... One of the, uh, one of the commentators on hybrid warfare in armies, yeah. uh, land warfare uh, doctrine, has pointed out that uh, if we move towards counter-ops, coin-ops, which is the new uh, term that is being used. I would like you to explain that later for our viewers, uh, that it would mean giving the Air Force the lead role. The? Lead role that the Army, because it would be a shift away from conventional to coin-ops, counter-insurgency operations and where air power would play a critical role and in other words, the lead role would have to be provided to the air force, whereas the army chief is on record saying that the army would still be the leading force. How I, do you respond I, to this? I, firstly, coin is not a new term. It's been an American term for a very, very long time. 
coin. Coin? Yes. Counter insurgency. But operation. so is hybrid warfare. Yeah, it is part of hybrid warfare. As it's said, also it's an part American of the uh, segment. Okay, so what we are, uh, hybrid coin you're saying is all of it comes under the category of subconventional warfare. No, other way around. Subconventional okay. warfare and coin are part of hybrid warfare, as is conventional warfare. So hybrid is much is more space than. Warfare. Yes, hybrid warfare is the, the, at the highest level. It includes all this. But to say that in hybrid warfare, in say coin, you give the lead role to the Air Force, I think that's drastically wrong. You see, firstly, in our own country, we are not using Air Force or artillery against uh, insurgents. We, we are not the American army which is going to go and, you know, not bother about the collateral damage. That apart, wherever US and NATO have been fighting, uh, say, say, the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or the ISIS, has the air power been able to subdue the, these uh, proxy forces? Not at all. So it's, it's wrong to say that the you lead role… You mean it's in, the ground forces that have always played the most critical course, role? Of course. Air Force has a role. Mm -hmm. But it can't be the lead role can be given to… And as far as we are concerned in our own country, we don't use the Air Force and the artillery, even the artillery. Mm -hmm. Not even uh, attack helicopters. So where is the question of giving the lead role to… But we have done it in the past. Where? We have done it in Mizoram. Mizoram was different. And Mizoram uh, was one time when a brigade operation with air was utilized. And which was again because of uh, the political hierarchy. Otherwise, that was not a class. Aizol was not a classical city which had to be bombed out. Let's return back to hybrid warfare. Yeah. So you were explaining that hybrid warfare is combines both the conventional and some conventional warfare. Plus, as the chief said, all forms of warfare. One of the important things he yeah. also refers to is the war of perception. Yeah. Will you explain what war of perception means? It is the information warfare. It is that information warfare which you see today on social media, which both the BJP and the Congress are playing. Hmm to attack your perception and lead your, uh, you know, thinking in one particular manner. Unfortunately, we do this more in politics. We don't do it. But then he also said that this social media should be controlled. One would assume that if it's a perception warfare, then let there be battle of ideas. How can you control the social media? Has anybody been able to do it other than Chinese? So what does the army chief mean when he says that it should be controlled? I suppose he is, I suppose he is talking of the serving soldiers, that they should not get involved into this. But otherwise you, you so cannot control So this is addressed it. to the troops themselves? Possibly. Possibly. He is talking of the troops under his command, that they should not get into this. But at the same time, when we are doing perception, uh, per perception warfare or information warfare in JNK, from our side, even the military has to be involved. As I said, hybrid warfare is against a nation. So, if well, one would say that the military always is involved because it comes out with its statements, it uh, responds to any any uh, comment that is made against it. So, it always intervenes, and it doesn't. Uh, its word is carried uh, by the media. So, its version of the story is always carried by the media. So why is it that you, what more needs to be done beyond that? No, I haven't got your question exactly. No, my point is that mm. in the war, in, you said in the war of perception, mm. it's information mm. that is like you use the example of BJP Congress, yeah. each trying to yeah. uh, dominate the social media coming out its, its version of the, of the narrative. Uh, to gain more ground and credence than the other persons. So it's a similar thing happening on the ground of, say, in JNK, as you said. Now, the, uh, the point I'm making is that if uh, army has to ensure that its version of the events or its narrative comes out, uh, that's already coming out. So what m more needs to be done? No, it is you have to tackle, say, in JNK, you mm -hmm. have to tackle radicalization. Right? So, if you are... What do you mean by radicalization? Like uh, the ideology, the Wahhabi ideology, the, the ISIS ideology. 
So there are why, hundreds of... Why should we be uh, marking out J and K when we forget that no, in the I'm rest of the you, country... I'm giving you examples. rest of the country, let me complete. Yeah. In the rest of the country, there is rapid radicalization uh, by the Hindutva elements. And it's, there is fear that this also probably permeates into the social media of the ex-service persons or the service persons and their families. And probably the, one of the reasons, one of the anxieties behind Army Chief's statement is to guard against that. So given that when radicalization is taking place in the entire country, the Hindus are getting radicalized and you're saying Wahhabism is there, why is that so special? It is, uh, as far as Why I'm should concerned, we ignore no, one and, as far and, as I'm and just focus on, on the... I am concentrating on areas where the army is involved in counterinsurgency. Okay, okay. That's but why Jammu I'm saying, is another, so you have hundreds Jammu, of... Jammu Kashmir is one state, right? Yes. So you Jammu have, has had the most unprecedented growth in Hindutva radicalization. While JNK has been undergoing this trouble, why is it that when the army talks about radicalization, it only talks about Wahhabism, but never talks about Hindutva radicalization in Jammu and Kashmir, which is you. area of your operation? Oh, let me tell you. Yes. You talked of uh, Hindutva radicalization in Jammu. What about the Muslim radicalization in Jammu? No, I'm. No, no, I'm. I'm. So General that's Kattoch, why I'm saying. General Kattoch, I, I, I. No, no. Now I'm let me also talk. Point. I'm now let me also talk. I'm not talking about that. No, the reason I'm pointing out is yeah. that we talk. Uh, there is enough talk about Islamic uh, fundamentalism or radicalization in Jammu and Kashmir. Yes. There is. It's all over media. What one never gets to hear is what is happening in Jammu, which is very much a part of Jammu and Kashmir, and its entire area is disturbed, and armed forces, special power, and army is deployed there. Yes. Given that, why is it that it's always silent on Hindutva radicalization that has taken place? And we have witnessed it in the last few years, uh, as your, your own writings vouch for it. I have not said so. In fact, it is the other way around. Mm. I have even said that how is it that when Article 370 was there, 4,000 Rohingyas have been settled in uh, Jammu. How is it that when the IB is saying that the Rohingyas were involved in the Sunjwan uh, military camp attack by Jem terrorists, how is it that no action has been taken against it? How is it that a chap like Yasin Malik? Why, no, why, no, why, no, 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 why no action has been taken? That is politics. Don't ask me. No, but tell me, this no, is no, a no, disturbed no. Let area, me, Let sir. me also give you more examples. No, I'm saying this is for 30 years, this has been a disturbed area. Yeah. An army has been called in. Yeah. Okay. There is central paramilitary forces deployed there. It's now under uh, precedence rule after uh, having experienced six months of governor's rule. How, why, despite all that and, and, and complete control now by the center, why is it any none of these any action is being taken? If you, as you yourself point out, that these they are serious issues. Why is it that nothing? Two reasons. Is being done? I mean, what politics Two reasons. is there? Now, yes, you let me talk. Yeah. yeah. First is that in all these areas, population the center of gravity. That is one, which is not being tackled. It is not a military solution. It is a political solution, right? Second, most important, and I've written about this. Do we have the political will at the center and the concerned states to finish this problem in JNK, in Naxalite area, Northeast? In my perception, no. Nobody is interested. Who are the people dying? Is the security forces dying? Who are the civilians getting uh, killed? They are the riffraff. Is any politician or uh, bureaucrat who is surrounded by layers of security being attacked? No. It's a game. That I is mean, being played, and I have written that number of times. Nobody has the will to finish the insurgency. When you say, uh, I mean, I, I grant you this point that uh, there has been no political solution, which is delayed, therefore, and prolonged the stay of the army in these areas, because these finally, at the end of the day, as you yourself point out, they, it requires a political solution, so that it ends, and there is a closure brought to it. But there is something uh, uh, 
but civilian riffraff that you talk about, what do you mean by that? Uh, civilian riffraffs versus the soldiers dying. I'm saying dying. the mango people like me, Aam Admi are getting killed. Hmm. No bureaucrat politician is getting killed. They are surrounded by layers of security. You tell me in JNK today, if there is a problem of unemployment, there is a problem of unemployment in the rest of India also, right? Why is it that the government doesn't come out, okay, this is the employment plan which we can create provided you give down, uh, lay down the gun. Are we interested? Nobody has done that. Nobody has reached out to the people. And of course, when... Which is when, what has and, prolonged and, the stay of and the involvement and the continuation of the... Because there is no political closure to this. No, because there is, a, there is no political will to close the case. There is no political will mm -hmm. to close the case. Neither at the center nor at the same as with Naxalite areas. Hmm. You know, Chidamram said in, two, three, in 2010, in three years, Naxalite uh, problem will be over. I know. <laughs> so did now Rajnath Singh. Rajnath Singh. Right? His latest statement is that he take... You read the article by RSN Singh in uh, Indian Defense Review. The things have actually gone worse. No, he is himself admitted that it will take another two, three years. So that keeps on getting prolonged because there is... They don't see beyond military solution. They're probably be banking on the military to, to crush it. Whereas, as you yourself point out, that beyond the point, it's, it has to be a political solution. Of course. Uh, the military which is, can keep the level of violence to a particular level. Even General V.K. Singh, if you remember, when he was the chief, he said so. He said the politicians are not optimized. Hmm. What the military has done. And then Farooq Abdullah jumped the roof. Saying that, no, but that's a very interesting point you made because this is precisely also what uh, the Supreme Court in 2016 observed that the prolonged use of military forces is actually a blot on our democracy because it means, he, they said, either the military is not able to bring about normalcy because and therefore it has failed or the civilian and the politicians therefore have failed not to make use of opportunities provided by the military through their operations. So I would like it, to qualify it even further. Hmm. You see, there's always talk of Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Nobody, nobody talked of the Disturbed Area Act. It is first the areas declared disturbed area and then the army is brought in. Army can't be functioning like the police, otherwise might as well use the police, which is equal number today as the army. If you want the Armed Forces Special Powers Act to be removed, you remove the Disturbed Area Act, army will go back to the border. Can you manage that? Neither the politician nor the bureaucrats have their guts because they will be lynched by the public. General Katoch, I think I'd like to end this yes. interview because this, what you have said is the very important point you have drawn attention to. Yeah. That, that while we talk about AFSPA, uh, unless the root cause is addressed, the disturbed area, if there was no disturbed area declared, army would not be called in, which is to say, if there was a political resolution of the problem before it gravitates to this or reaches this stage where the army has to be called in, before that it must be resolved. Or after the army is called in, they are able to restore order that's the time the political opportunities should be seized and a solution worked out. Restoring I think order, again, is a very loose term. As okay, I said, sir. order can be restored by keeping the violence at a particular level. Mm. Army cannot restore the situation no, bring totally. about, yeah, political solution has to be brought so about the politicians. have we made any progress towards removing the Disturbed Area Act? No. We are very happy with the, you know, 240 terrorists killed and surgical strikes and whatnot. Have we done anything to progress by for removing the disturbed area act? No. I think what that's has a, that's which government done anything about it? No, I think that's a very important point because if we see, and this is the note we'd like to uh, end uh, today, but we'll return and uh, have. Uh, General Katoch, Lieutenant General Katoch with us again uh, to discuss because these, these issues are not going to go away very soon and we'll need uh, someone like you to explain to our viewers uh, from time to time 
uh, what is happening on the ground and what is the armed forces own perception of the events. Thank you for watching News Click. If you have any feedback, do get back to us.